Um, so, our next speaker, um, I've just met uh, Katarina Gray Sharp. Uh, Katarina is of Ngati Rangi, Ngati Raukara, Ngati, Ngati Kaufata, and Ngati Rangiwehi descent. She describes herself uh, very beautifully and movingly as a mama, uh, a pauaru, a ringawera, and a kaikaranga. Uh, you can probably guess the first one, a mama, <laughs> uh, a widow, a worker, and a first voice. She's edited a book on Te Tiriti o Waitangi, uh, the foundation document of New Zealand, um, and she's written also on the experience of being Māori in the academy. And I noticed um, uh, there was so much to take from Kevin's talk, but one of the things that I did notice was um, a, one of the very important Haudenosaunee, uh, well, kopapa would be the Māori word, um, was taking responsibility. And that is also Katarina's theme. Her PhD thesis is on her responsibility uh, in an age of extinctions. Um, and she's going to talk to us uh, about um, extinctions and responsibility. Please welcome Katarina Gracia. Te this paper presents my replication study of Sabalos 8L 2015 using 2018 data. It considers the etymology of responsibility as an agential construct. Finally, it makes suggestions for a non-agential responsibility informed by first, Matauranga Māori, and second, Levinasian ethics. In lieu of verbal and text citations for quotes, you are invited to contact me for a copy of the paper. Let us begin. Extinction is the permanent disappearance of a species throughout its entire range, caused by the failure to reproduce and the death of all remaining members. An expected phenomenon, taxons are classed as extinct when there is no reasonable doubt that the last individual has died. Due to data uncertainties, extinctions are quantified as fractions versus absolute numbers. For example, there is an accepted background rate of between 0.1, apologies, and one extinction per million species years. This means that at the higher rate, if there were one million species, one species would become extinct each year as a normal part of the evolutionary process. Mass extinctions are extinctions of the greatest magnitude, occurring when many diverse groups of organisms become extinct over short periods of time. In November 2017, 15,372 scientists declared the scientific consensus. Mass extinctions have occurred at least five times in the past. A sixth mass extinction has begun. Humans are the cause of the latest episode. However, the oft-repeated claim that Earth's biota is entering a sixth mass extinction depends on clearly demonstrating current extinction rates are far above the background rates. Sabalos 8L 2015 gathered 2014 data from the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. The IUCN Red List of Threatened Species is a checklist of taxa that have undergone an extinction risk assessment using the IUCN Red List categories and criteria. It does not cover the whole tree of life, only a sample. Currently, the Red List hosts data on species from four kingdoms, fungi, plantae, animalia, and chromista. 
The IUCN classifies evaluated species with adequate data into extinction risk categories from least concerned to extinct. Sabalus et al. developed current extinction rates for five core data or vertebrate groups. Mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians and fishes. They present two current extinction rates based on IUCN categories. The highly conservative rate, shown in the slide in black, only includes species that have been categorised by IUCN as extinct. The conservative or combined rate, shown on the slide in white, includes these extinct species alongside species declared extinct in the wild and a subcategory of critically endangered, the possibly extinct. I collected data for the same taxonomic groups as Sabalus 8L for all publication years available in 2018, including 2015, 2016, 2017 and 2018, from the IUCN website. I also collected unspecified data for all listed taxonomic groups, including invertebrates and plants. Like Sabalus 8L, I collected for two rates. The first was under the assessment category extinct. The, the second was for a combined rate. Due to a change in IUCN categories between 2014 and 2018, my combined rate includes two new critically endangered subcategories, critically endangered, possibly extinct, and critically endangered, possibly extinct in the wild. I am happy to show anyone who would like to collect IUCN data how to do so. I analysed all data following the method outlined in Spilus 8L. Although other methods are avail available, such as that of PIM 8L 2014, I found none is clear in the description. As shown in this slide, I express the method as an equation. It includes the same background rate used by the authors. That rate is the higher mammalian background extinction rate, rounded upward to two extinctions per 10,000 species per century. This rate reflects the taxa under study and allows for a more conservative assessment of differences between current and past extinction rates for the vertebrates as a whole. A simplified version of the equation appears at the bottom left. My left, you're right. This table shows the equation and application for vertebrates that have been categorised by IUCN as extinct across all publication years available in 2018. If you have a calculator on your cell phone, you can calculate the result for all taxonomic groups as I show you how it works. On the left, oh, it's your right. Um, was it your left? It's your left. Very good. On the left are the taxonomic groups. Column X is the number of evaluated species. Column A shows that number in a per 10,000 species per century ratio. For example, the total number of vertebrates is divided by 10,000 for a rounded ratio of 4.66. Column B is the rounded mammalian background extinction rate of two. And C is the number of centuries since 1500. Columns B and C are multiplied to provide the expected background rate for the given time frame as shown in column D. Columns A and D are multiplied to render the expected extinction since 1500 shown in column E. For vertebrates, this number is 48.23. Column F lists the actual observed extinctions. In the case of vertebrates, that is 361. When the observed extinctions of F are divided by the expected of E, the extinction rate is the quotient. For vertebrates, that number is, if you use your calculator, 7.48. For all taxonomic groups, that number is 8.99. This figure compares the 2014 and 2018 results for vertebrates classified as extinct. My analysis of the 2014 data finds a current rate for extinction-only vertebrates of 8.38. The 2018 data suggests a fall to 7.48. This is still higher than the background rate. The report does not lighten when classes are considered. As the most highly studied animal groups, mammals and birds continue to lose ground in the extinct-only rates. The improvement in fish's extinction rate is likely due to an increase of almost 4,000 evaluated species. This slide displays both extinct and combined rates of extinction. The far right yellow bar shows the 2014 rate of extinction for vertebrates classified as extinct, extinct in the wild and possibly extinct. At 14.86, it compares positively with the 2018 combined data next door in green of 14.2. I draw your attention to the tallest bars in this figure. Although their extinct only assessments are lower, amphibians appear the most at risk. 
The combined category extinction rate for amphibians was 22.14 in 2014. Now it is 23.4. In summary, the current rates range between 1.9 and 11.7 times higher than the background rate of two extinctions per million species years. The results confirm the continuation of the current mass extinction. There were differences between my results and those of Sabalosate L. My analysis of the data provided by their authors in the supplementary material produces a lower number of observed, observed extinctions for 2014 in the extinct in the wild and possibly extinct categories. I found 18 less vertebrate species, four mammal, five bird, one reptile, reptile two amphibian and six fishes. Hence, my 2014 calculated rate of current extinction in the combined categories for mammals is 18.88 versus the original 19.59. I outline this and other differences in my thesis. The current extinction rate is accepted in the literature as a range between 100 and 1,000 times greater than the background rate. That range is calculated on a much lower background rate than Sabalos et al. in my replication study. Our results show a range at least 10 times lower than the literature. Nevertheless, an exceptionally rapid loss of biodiversity is still revealed, indicating that a sixth mass extinction is already underway. Now we move to my prime concept, responsibility. Responsibility is related to the Proto-Indo-European etymon spend, meaning execution of ritual and offering. Such acts can be seen in the ceremonies of libation, where one remembers the dead in the pouring of drink. Current conceptions of responsibility reflect this promise of respectful conduct, whilst emphasising agency. This section provides an etymology. According to the Oxford Dictionary of English, responsibility has two definitions that are relational and one that is agential. First, responsibility is defined as a duty or obligation for something. Second, responsibility is the state or fact of being accountable or to blame for something. Third, it is a characteristic of agency, an opportunity or ability to act independently. Agency is the degree to which a subject is able to determine the course of their own actions. Agency is posed conceptually in opposition to structures that may affect that degree, such as the institutions of democracy, heterosexuality, and paid employment. In this third definition of responsibility, the agent has the possibility or capacity for autonomous action. Indeed, an agent is characterised by the degree to which this is true. Adjectives can be added to further elucidate responsibility as term. For instance, a person has causal responsibility if one was the direct or indirect cause of something. Legal responsibility is an accountability under the law, either as a legal obligation or penalty for an offence. Moral responsibility links two notions, the having of a moral obligation and the fulfilment of the criteria for deserving blame or praise, punishment or reward, for a morally significant act or omission. Role responsibility is likely the most practically significant in its articulation of duties. For example, a job or profession or social role will be partly defined in terms of the responsibilities it involves. Whilst the legal and moral elucidations host a relational form, all four conceptions offer opportunity to choose and are therefore agential. Responsibility thusly posed is a feature of agency that at times is used to denote an action or sphere of action which is part of someone's duty. It is an expression of individuality, liberty and self-rule. However, this interpretation of responsibility is a construct of particular circumstances. Responsibility is a noun derived from the adjective responsible. Like its derivative, responsible is about obligation, answerability, blame, credit and duty. It has no equivalent in Old English. The term did not arrive in the language until the 1590s as answerable rather than Latin and French. The Latin sources contain elements of the relation present in later reflexes. They begin with sponsus, meaning an ancient formula of prayer, and spondio, treaties, etc., to promise meaning in bargains, covenants, treaties, etc., to promise solemnly, or to promise for another, to promise security for a person. With the addition of prefix re, meaning back, the verb respondio is to promise a thing in return for something else, to offer or present in return. Its present active infinitive respondier appears at the point when responsibility attained legal ramifications, specifically in the development of common law and judicial hierarchies. Respondier was an instrument of law development, interpretation and comment that operated for over 600 years from the Roman Republic through to the rule of Emperor Hadrian. There was a custom in the Republic of Pontiff magistrates giving legal rulings as an act of service. 
Seeking stability, Emperor Augustus and the early Principate maintained the customer's responsa prudentium, opinions given without remuneration by jurists to those seeking interpretations of law. Eos respondendi was the right granted to favour jurists by Augustus to give responsa by special imperial authority or patent. Later, systemic amendments would add qualification of expertise and remuneration. The change in responsibility from a reciprocal arrangement to a legal one can be understood in terms of Roman bureaucracy. The legal aspect was reinforced and its structures redesigned as a consequence of the French influence in English. French began as a dialect of Latin. Attested as distinct from the 19th century, Old French was a literate language within 200 years. The adoption of responsibilities legal sense from Latin is an evidence within 500 years. The noun responsur, meaning a type of vassal in the feudal system, the man who must pay in perpetuity a lord, the grant of an ecclesiastical fief, is attested from 1284, and the adjective responsable, meaning who answers, who is guarantor, from 1304. The adjective indicates an ability to respond, as in responsible, and has been defined as responsive, responding, corresponding. Its first appearance in English in the late 16th century is answerable to another for something, indicates a shift from a promise to an imperative. Moral judgment is attested from 1766 with a letter to the third Duke of Grafton, Augustus Fitzroy, from the exiled member of Parliament, John Wilkes. We published the following year, it concerns Grafton's message that Wilkes should contain the Earl of Chatham and Lord Privy Seal William Pitt. Wilkes' response declares Chatham's new office, functionally that of Prime Minister, neither important nor responsible. Unlike responsible, responsibility first appears as a term in late modern English. Though attested from 1787 as the condition of being responsible, an agential rendering appeared a few years earlier with regard to the degree of responsibility belonging to the office of offices of cashier and accountant. Agency is even clearer in the translated 1793 declaration of Vicomte de la Platière and French Minister of Interior, Jean-Marie Laurent. On 21 January, Louis XVI of France was executed. Two days later, Roland stated, quote, I have done my duty and I will not shrink from the responsibility attached to the delibera deliberations in which I have taken part but I declare that I will not sign the general account of the State of the Nation to be presented by the Executive Council on the 1st of February." End quote. He resigned instead. The translation of Roland's declaration may be interpreted as an example of a political origin for responsibility. As Gareth Williams states, quote, in all modern European languages, responsibility only finds a home toward the end of the 18th century within debates about representative government, end quote. However, in the translation of Roland's words and this is the seed of contemporary conceptions. Roland accepts the promise he has made as representative. He fulfills his legal, moral and role responsibilities. The promise is refined in the translation through a claim to autonomous action and free will. I will not shrink from the responsibility. His resignation is rational action guided by motives and purposes amenable in principle to conscious scrutiny and correction and consisting of decision-making and choice. That claim to autonomy and rational action expresses the revolution taking place in the European mentality. A new feeling of self-reliance and self-assurance, readiness to seek and try unorthodox solutions to any current trouble and worry, belief in the ascending tendency of human history, and growing trust in the capacity of human reason. Roland's translator is presenting a completely modern conception of responsibility. Current agential conceptions of responsibility likewise reproduce this tendency towards individual freedom and rationality. The move from a spiritual to a legalistic interpretation reflected the expansion of bureaucracy in the Roman Empire's colonial project. Equally, the emphasis on agency in current definitions reflects the norms of modernity. Hence, responsibility mediates the development of a new fabric of selfhood rooted in concepts of individuality, autonomy, and freedom. It allows the site of control to be localized as such, it becomes mātauranga, something that can, but need not, rest in me. Decolonisation is a process which engages with imperialism and colonialism at multiple levels. For researchers, one of those levels is concerned with having a more critical understanding of the underlying assumptions, motivations and values which inform research practices. I approach research aware that the solutions I pose must reclaim history, must centre our concerns and worldviews as Indigenous peoples, so that we may develop our own theoretical and research approaches for our own purposes. 
an explicit, codified and externalised form of knowledge, mātauranga, offers an initial base for this approach. Mātauranga is a, is a transferable, active structure that sometimes takes the form of a wise and knowledgeable person. Mato means know, understand, be certain of, the suffix tanga deriving a noun. It is a shared knowledge, ma and to, said to be attained when it is held or comes to rest within us. When an inherited erudition, it is matauranga Māori. Such response, such response to the three great questions of life, namely, who am I? What is this world that I exist in? What am I to do? However, Matauranga Māori is not like an archive of information, but rather is like a tool of think for thinking, organising information, organising the ethics of knowledge, the appropriateness of it all, and informing us about our world and our place in it. Matauranga Māori offers a perspective on extinction. Williams, 18, from 1852, lists the number of verbs in the reo for extinction as it relates to fire. Keto, keto, ke wa, nyo, e weroku. Closer to the contemporary meaning is the concept of paringaru, literally hidden house, where genealogical lines are without offspring and become extinct. Tikanga exists for its prevention amongst humans, including child, bearing, child rearing by others, whangai o taurima, and repartnering for barren peers, punarua. Amongst the people of Ngātukuwaru, this is my paternal grandmother's people, the actions of the Tuatanui towards Moipoko may be considered another strategy. As in other places, Wanganui, which is my paternal grandfather's people, have an idiom, pera ki te moa, for the idea that something has become extinct like the moa. Indeed, the moa has become the extinct version of the kiwi, mourned at international conservation events to affirm nationhood. This is because, when compared to others, the moa's life is, is constructed as grievable. I am now going to try something flash, and we'll see if this works. At this so I'm going to be referring to this thing. There we go. Yeah, accepted and moved. There we go. Um, no. There we are. For example, we here at L display the predominance of more and ancestral proverbs, Fakatoki, via a figure comparing number of Fakatoki with number of archaeological sites evidence found. A note to the figure states. Bird represented in blue, i.e. moa and poakai, become extinct prior to the European arrival, but other extinct birds do not occur in the Fakatoki and are thus not shown. So I'm going back to that flash thing again. See if this works. Yep. So this is the figure. Oh, it's not working for you. Never mind. I'll just go back to my PowerPoint. It did the first time. It's not working this time. It's okay. We'll just move on. No, that's not what I mean. But it's okay. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. A review of supplementary evidence, so the material at the back of the article, shows six other extinct avifauna with proverbial reference. All were represented in the figure in orange, like the extant, that is, the currently living species. For example, keridu. Pukatoki about these birds were not stated in the text. In most cases, the sole mention in the article was in the figure. All birds were made extinct post-settler colonisation. The identification of the moa as the poster species and hashtag for extinction in New Zealand has consequences. It allows the timing of extinction to be isolated to a time before settler colonialism. Like a prehistoric dinosaur, the narrative of the biodiversity crisis becomes one with the past, incapable of resolution. It allows attribution of blame to pre-European social formations, Avowing indigenous savagery is a standard strategy for unsettled nation, nation building. Um, further, hashtag more confirms the role of conservation science as an archive of, of obituaries. It is the means by which a life becomes or fails to become a publicly grievable life, an icon for national self-recognition, the means by which a life becomes noteworthy. Hence, in the Moore's shadow, hashtag Moore's shadow, the vulnerability, the very existence of other species, extinct and extant, is made unreal. They cannot be mourned because they are always, always already lost, or rather never were, and those that survive must be killed since they seem to live on stubbornly, stubbornly, in the state of deadness. I think this is why Wehi 8L could not recognise the extinction of the koreke, 
the Hakuwai, the Moho, the Pio Pio, the Whekau, and the Huia. I also think adherence to Matauranga Māori's ethical imp imperatives may have resulted in a different outcome. Structuring the sixth mass extinction. As a contributor to Kaupapa Māori research, uh, so my second supervisor is Linda Tuhi Waismith, I use a variety of Matauranga Māori approaches and sources in my work. For example, I conducted an exegesis on Ripiripia, a traditional funeral chant that opened this presentation, to help me understand my research problem. Electing a waita over other Matauranga Māori sources reflects my methodology, and that song embodies the creative source of all mana, that is mana mutuhake. The exegesis of Ripiripia has described a tool for thinking and unearthed the structure of relevance to mass extinction research. Structure could be described as a recurring pattern and in social settings the ordered interrelationships between the different elements of a social system. It may appear in iterations, sedimentary layers, built as a river, carves a bed, carves a valley. As an institutionalised social arrangement, a structure can appear as the rules that underline and create the outward features of a society, the social relations that underpin pin these superficial features. Structure they, thus may be posed as oppositional to agency and that it can limit autonomous action. As a category, structure prioritises the logic of relations over the logic of substance. Hence, it is useful for identifying connections with neither apparent agent nor aim. The extinction crisis can be seen as an outward feature of a society structured by the long-established dominance of humans over our non-human kin. It follows a paradigm of exceptionalism, where humans are different from all other organisms. All human behaviour is controlled by culture and free will, and all problems can be solved by human ingenuity and technology. It extends to a worldview that sees humans as the source of all value, since the concept of value itself is a human creation, and that sees nature as of value merely as a means to the ends of human beings. That worldview is anthropocentrism, which I mispronounced just then. Anyway, in Western philosophy, this human centeredness can be traced from Protagoras' man as measure to Aristotle's scala naturae and hylomorphism. It is classically maintained in modernity by Kantian ethics, where rationalism marks personhood and the rest of nature Marx's personhood and the rest of nature is defined as a sphere of things devoid of intrinsic moral value or worth in themselves. It can be said in Conte's interpretation of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel and onwards. The Darwinian revolution of 1859 was meant to abolish such anthropocentrism. No longer accompanied by divinity, humankind would finally understand itself as part of the evolutionary stream. Instead, Victorian Darwinists worried that close similarities between man and the rest of the animal world destroyed any purpose of human existence other than that which all animals have. In the survival of the fittest, the overall purpose of existence is the necessity for reproduction. Sexuality, therefore, becomes the most important motivation for human behaviour. The emphasis on genetics and speciation of extinction in evolutionary circles and the impact of Roe versus Wade in US society, for example, gain additional meaning. Instead of destroying the paradigm of human exceptionalism, Darwinism did it anew. In addition to being structured by human exceptionalism and anthropocentrism, the current mass extinction is a recurring pattern of relations that underpins features we experience in the everyday. By this, I tend an argument that the extinction crisis is itself a structure. Like narrative, and in this case language, the sixth mass extinction is a network of interrelated units, the meaning of the parts being specifiable only with reference to the whole. The untimely death of an individual, the unfortunate extirpation of a population, and the unexpected extinction of a species are interconnected acts of a narrative. The broader meaning of these acts cannot be comprehended without reference to the structure of anthropogenic mass extinction. The crisis provides the social arrangements, arrangements by the by which the independent units can be understood. The narrative is one of violence. Expanding on the humanism of sociologist Johann Galtung, I recognise the sixth mass extinction as, quote, the cause of the difference between the potential and the actual, unquote, close quote. There is a significant gap between what could have been and what is. The potential rate of one maximum extinction per million species years is actually exceeded almost nine times over. The ultimate cause of the disparity is human activity. Our actions and inactions are a violence against our non-human kin. I identify the sixth mass extinction as a form of structural violence. The violence is built into the structure and that a personal subject remains undefined. 
Instead, the collective noun of humanity is invoked as concealing the vast inequalities of harm and suffering that attend global patterns of ecological rupture. This is a meaningful composition in two ways. First, by conjuring a homogenous figure of humanity, causal responsibility is avoided. Agency is no longer assigned, particularly to those who benefit from the anthropogenic drivers of industrialisation, international trade, global economic growth and resource extraction. This is because agentive descriptions influence the attribution of blame and punishment, which would likely be costly. Instead, drivers are identified as the unintended outcome of human development, allowing attribution to be shared equally. In this case, inequality is more equitable. Of utility, a weakness is made visible. Ethical systems directed against intended violence, as in that with agency, will easily fail to capture structural violence in their nets. Second, the anthropogenic order that distributes the right to classify is maintained. Extinct species are not the primary object of the structure, but collateral damage. Such collateral is, of course, an intentional outcome, for otherwise it would be prevented. Its creation is an example to those who may resist as may be attested by survivors of 15 March. The consequences of being classified as non-human are untenable. So here I'm here to you who are from here, for the things that you have done for those people who died, and for the things that you have done for those who continue to live. To be classed as non-human is untenable. No matter one's rank in the hierarchy of humanity, it is apparently better to be in the hierarchy than not. The ensuing violence is both physical and psychological. In the physical form, it lowers somatic capacity to the point of death. Like the structural violence of mass human incarceration, it also constrains movement. Ironically, both climate change and conservation efforts, for example, reservations, captive breeding programs, disrupt the range of various species. As psychological violence, it reduces our ability to perceive and respond to it. The structural violence of the sixth mass extinction is both negative and positive. In the negative mode, existing population, species and relationships are eliminated. In the positive mode, elimination is an organising principle rather than a one-off and superseded occurrence. For example, adaptation allows vulnerable populations, human and non-human, to contribute to the new relation through, for example, ecological services. Hence, mass extinction is the negation of life in order to establish and maintain exogenous elimination with expropriated resources, including the bodies of the dead and the labour of their survivors. I now wish to make some suggestions towards a non-agential responsibility informed by first Mataranga Māori and the second the Venusian ethics. The suggestions are made in the context of research conducted outside of the natural sciences, sciences I am not a scientist, into the current mass extinction. They are intended to be generative and protective for those who are called to the vocation, so vocari, so calling, of what I term mass extinction studies. I would like to help keep safe any researchers who are drawn without will. Mataranga Māori is an indigenous body of knowledge that arises from a worldview based upon kinship relationships between people and the natural world. It offers tools for thinking about the consequences of current extinction rates. These include exegetical analyses that make visible the episode's structural violence. Mataranga Māori also poses questions about the ethical consequences of such knowledge. If we have evidence that our non-human kin, and indeed our own offspring, are being deprived of life and strength, what is our responsibility? Levinasian ethics would propose a calling into question of the ego, such that subjectivity starts from the other, revealing a figure in the shape of my responsibility for them. This subjectivity is a priori, an unchosen obligation, which assumes me before the responsibility of freedom. Neither memorizable nor refutable. Here, subjectivity is not, a condition on cho- is not conditional on choice. It constitutes me even before I begin to choose. Thus, the mastery that is my will is subjected. A form of non-agential responsibility in research that references Levinasian ethics would begin with an awareness of our incarnate subjectivity, a recurrence to oneself, out of an irrecusable exigency of the other a duty overflowing my being, a duty becoming a debt. When that indebtedness is viewed through Mataranga Māori, we find it is first to whakapapa. 
Whakapapa is a layering of relationships, inherently non-hierarchical in structure and purpose, serving to link all facets of creation in a complex web that extends in all directions and into infinity. My initial suggestion towards a non-agential responsibility draws from this whakapapa through two lines in the chart that open this presentation, Lipiripia. The first is a question, e te tohu o te ringa ringa. What is the sign of the hand? Frequently representative of whole persons, hands are actors for command in the realm. As even non-human actors may have subjectivity, our mountain ancestor of Ruapiu, for example, is an ego, Latin for I, as is the family cat. Hands can justifiably substitute. But the Ripiripia hand also has a tohu of its own. The tohu is a sign, a token of remembrance, and the act of protecting, watching over. In its presence, we find not a singular metaphor, but a series of metonymies. Metonymy replaces the name of one thing with the name of something else closely associated with it. For example, the bottle for alcoholic drink, the press for journalism. The tohu represents the hand that substitutes the person. The second line is an answer. He kawa kawa. The leaf. A plant used to treat different ailments. Metaphorically, the herb denotes the beginning and ending of life. Different parts of the plant can be used as an aphrodisiac to ensure conception and as a symbol of grief. Following Eichenbaum's metonymy, the hand is displaced to lend its meaning to the leaf it holds in contiguity. In my non-agential responsibility, we are each a oneself, a raukotai, single leaf, replacing those for whom we stand as tohu, a whole kawakawa tree of ancestors and descendants, of cousins, human and otherwise. Thus substituted, the researcher's subjectivity may be found in the plant's caress, desire, joy and sorrow. A second suggestion for a non-agential responsibility, tai pākoro, considers an indeclinable submission and is based on an idiom of my paternal grandfather's people of Wanganui. Tai pākoro describes someone as arriving heavily laden. In arriving somewhere new laden with and aware of one's own sorrow, we can see it in others. As Alfonso Lingus notes, quote, suffering is a bond with others. One does not suffer without understanding that others suffer understanding how others suffer, end quote. I came to my research burdened, a widow seeking to both give meaning to my sorrow and recreate for others the comfort I had received in my grief. Compassion is from the Latin compati. Pati means to suffer and come with. Pai pākoro is the sense that overtook me, an unwilled suffering, a generative compassion. I am bonded to and suffer with our cousins, the human and more than human but it is a trial and terror. I experienced ideation after the calculations of the third chapter. I was suicidal after the sixth. Subsequent to describing some of the structures of the current extinction crisis, my own death appeared completely logical. I felt tricked into staying alive and resented our children for justifying my survival. This obligation to my children, this compassion for beloveds who have already lost one parent, is also something I arrived with to this work. Indeed, their presence was a belongingness that made it possible. A feeling of belonging, to long for and to be longed for, is a sensation of proximity that keeps the researcher safe. Following Levinas, the sensation is, quote, an obsession, irreducible to consciousness, and responsibility for the other, for life and death, the adjectives unconditional, undeclinable, absolute take on meaning, end quote. Life here is a sensuality that undercuts the realm of thought. Life here is felt as divine, reflecting its etymological relation to shine, sun and deity. Complementary to the mystery of death, life is ora, shining in the sun. Where Tai Pākoro disturbs, my third suggestion, the Mao, gives space for acknowledging our burdens. A ma'o is a veranda that provides shelter before and after entering a house, giving space to remove and replace footwear. In my people's architecture, the ma'o demarcates boundaries between inside, outside, tapu, noa, life, death. As a kaikaranga, I have called bereaved visitors to the ma'o and sat with them. They arrived as substitutes, a beloved's face visible in their crumpled form. 
for a while, what is carried may be laid down. There are agential practices to protect the mass extinction researcher, month off upon completion of each major piece of writing, active engagement with our loved ones, regular alone time making music. In order to do this work to meet one's obligations, I advocate for space away from it. However, as evidenced by my mental health crises, these agential acts have not always been sufficient. The Ma'o then is a calling and, ex and an acceptance when agency fails. In my case, it was both a voice inside my head that sent me to and the actuality of my mother. Like those made by me barefoot on grass, the voice was a call by a first speaker. It was someone beyond myself who waited for me, who dreamed of me, who knew me before I knew myself. Strangely, it also felt like my husband during the birth of our third child, patiently leading me to second stage. It was a call I responded to without will. My mother, comparatively, has a unique gift of non-judgment and applies our nanny's listening skills with great skill, listening techniques with great skill. It meant I could sit on her porch talking until I came to my own conclusions. The ma'o offers a controlled transition so that we may carry on. The call and acknowledging our burdens are its process. My non-agential responsibility conforms with relational forms. There are still duties and the possibility of being held to account. However, it is absent of liberty, particularly the ability to choose. Such freedom is a form of rule and rank relative to others. It produces not only self-rule, but also the self as ruler. Maintenance of such a position requires a concept of exceptionalism, for who is more exceptional than he who rules? alongside a worldview that finds oneself as the source of all value. Beyond its generative and protective factors, a non-agential responsibility actively denies the structures that underpin the mass extinction crisis. Kati tenakoto tatou katoa.